So hi everyone, my name is Ellis. I think I'll just kind of like begin uh, the lecture about Eastern philosophy and Buddhism. And thank you for being here, first of all. It's nice to be in your company. And uh, I think as, as people come in, I will try to repeat the main goal of what I want to achieve in this lecture is to um, clarify some of the confusion inside of Buddhism um, and make it a little more simple, hopefully, and that um, you can create a daily practice for yourself that is very beneficial and leads to each individual becoming happy. Like, um, that's really the collective goal, I believe, of world peace in Buddhism is for each individual to become happy. Now, what that means to each person is different for everyone. So, uh, seems like a complicated goal, world peace, right? With everything that we have going on. So, first of all, I'd like to speak about some of the basics in Eastern philosophy, starting back with the ancient Vedic system, which was a system of knowledge that was quite enlightened. And from that, Hinduism, Sanskrit, languages that were very powerful and seemed to be connected with spiritual development. Actually, uh, the alphabet or the, the sequence of Sanskrit uh, characters is a representation of spiritual development. So it's kind of neat how that language has that embedded inside of it. So I want to express that there are two forms of happiness that you all might know this, but relative happiness where we get something that we like or maybe we attain a new yoga pose or maybe we're able to eat vegan for a long enough period of time or attain something um, and then we feel relatively happy. Maybe we get our financial situation settled or um, our relationship situation is nice for a time. Then we feel relatively happy. Like It's like in relative happiness, we feel relative happy. So what about absolutely happy? Like no matter what happens to us, what kind of things we might have to face in life. So Buddhism deals with the challenge of building an absolute happiness in your life so that the problems or the obstacles become like treasures, really. Um, now that seems foreign for a lot of people in the West, but from the Eastern approach of, say, like a, a Japanese woman who's been practicing Buddhism for like 20, 30 years, she, you know, you can just tell her, oh, Koko-san, it's a horrible day. I just, I drank too much beer and I totaled my car and, you know, and she's like, oh, congratulations, you know, because she has this kind of spirit of like, hey, you, you've expiated another obstacle in your life. You've, you've like turned up, you've stirred up your muddy pond, so to speak, to where you know what's going on in your life. So I was always surprised at that at first, like, encountering these stronger, older women's division. You know, we have a lot of women here, and thanks to Tyrus, we've got a guy here at the moment. Um, but it was the women's division, you know, that she had shared that with me, and I saw that kind of fighting spirit, that kind of spirit to not only do I, I deserve and need to become happy, but I, I would like to help other people become happy too. So it becomes a prayer and a practice for yourself and for others. And that's a way to keep it balanced. Now for others, that means not just your favorite people or, you know, you've got to, if you want to begin this process called human revolution as prescribed by Buddhism, and I'll give you, I'll give you some history and I'll give you a little structure about some of the theories. So let me see, it's, oh, okay, that's cool. Little power break. All right, the power. We changed. Little it. intermission switch. <laughs> so, okay. So relative happiness, absolute happiness. 
and the collective goal of, the, of Buddhism or Eastern philosophy is to realize world peace through each individual becoming happy. So, anyone know the historical Buddha Shakyamuni, or also known as Siddhartha, or Gautama Buddha? He was the traditional person referred to as the Buddha. Well, Buddha just means awakened one. Take it for what it is. It's not necessarily the person. It also refers to a life condition that each of us have inside of us called a Buddha condition or an awakened, enlightened life condition. And I'll share a little bit of history um, with myself in, in the path in that uh, moving to New York City at a young age and becoming an actor, and then I toured Europe as Huckleberry Finn. I, I did like 119 shows in Europe, and I struggled in the ghetto of Manhattan from Louisiana to, to become an actor. And I really struggled and I resented it, and I, it was really hard for me but later on in life, when I worked at this place called the New York Open Center, I was vegan. I did an extreme amount of yoga because I always wanted to try to keep high and happy, you know, and, and exercise and rollerblading. And I worked at this place called the New York Open Center. And I went into the bookstore, and I had been in Pensacola doing hatha yoga and chanted what's called the Lotus Sutra. The Lotus Sutra being one of the final teachings of the historical Buddha. Now, supposedly there's about 40,000 sutras that came out of this person's philosophy. This person I'm talking about, Shakyamuni, Siddhartha, Watoma Buddha. He was king of the Shakya clan in northern India. Um, so I'll jump back to his history. He um, he, he, his father was a very peaceful man, a Brahmin, a Brahmin uh, respecting the higher forces of heaven, doing yoga, getting in rhythm, getting your mind, body, and soul into rhythm. His father was very peaceful. They would do um, rituals like in the river in northern India, like ablutions where they purify themselves with water. And so his father was a very refined king of the northern India. So he escaped the palace and discovered there were these things that we have to deal with called birthing. He saw somebody aging and old, getting older, you know, have all, all these injuries and things. And then aging, getting older, he saw a sick person, and he saw a pregnant woman giving birth, so he saw the birthing, and he saw someone die off in a coffin. So he basically narrowed it down to these four basic conditions that we all have to go through. And he labeled the time that you and I live in as a latter day or a time in which greed and anger and ignorance take a bigger stage. And it creates a wonderful opportunity, though. Don't be discouraged because the wonderful law of the lotus, which in Sanskrit is Sadhanma Pundarika Sutram. So that's like. So that's a sounding of the title of the Lotus Sutra that Shakyamuni later in his life emanated the absolute truth, in a sense. Because his disciples were like, please share with this infinite wisdom, this infinite enlightenment. And he's like, no, no, you're not ready for it. But he had spent such long time of his career painting the picture so that people could do the 12, 12 link meditation on causation, cause and effect, the meditation on empty space, the yogas, the things that came out of Buddhism were all helping people raise their awareness. Just like we choose to eat vegan, helps raise our vibration and raise our awareness. So Shakyamuni set out on his own a mission to conquer greed, anger, and stupidity. So he saw Birthing, aging, sickness, death, greed, anger, and stupidity. So he's like, whoa, this is a problem. But that was his lifelong concern, was like how to attain enlightenment and happiness. So um, that's, what call, that's what's called the three vehicle teachings. The three vehicle teachings, from the standpoint of the Lotus Sutra, 
And this, this Lotus Sutra here is a 28, I believe it's 28 chapters long. From the standpoint of this teaching at the end of his career, he died at about 80 years old, the traditional Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama. And so at about 40 years into his preaching career, he revealed this, uh, this thing called the Lotus Sutra. Well, we're going to get to that, and I had just sounded out the title of this, this volume of his was called Sarhamma Pundarika Sutra. But then in, in transliterated Chinese into Japanese, it's Sanskrit Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. So that means the wonderful law of the lotus. The wonderful law of the lotus. So <clears throat> when I was a young man at, uh, working in the open center and, and trying to figure out how to feed myself and go to Whole Foods because I wanted to eat the good food, because they had a Whole Foods down in Manhattan and Soho. And so I would spend most of my money there. <laughs> it was like whole paycheck to me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I went into the bookstore and looked on uh, The Artist's Way. Artist's Way was, was a course by Julia Cameron. And Julia Cameron and Mark Cameron wrote books together. And one of their books that they wrote together was The Artist in Finances. So I was like, I went into the bookstore and I was so skinny from so much yoga and eating so right and being starving and healthy. And, and uh, I looked up in the bookstore and I saw this book, and I was like, in the open center, how do you deal with astrology to Zen, like, the, the wide world of spiritual information, right? It can fill bookstores or libraries. Where do you begin? Where do you, well, in, in Manhattan, in the New York open center, I kid you not, and I'll share this in my novel, I think I'm going to write this in my book that I'm writing, but um, the book was up high shelf, it was like that, and it was glowing apart from the rest to me. But I was in Manhattan and I was hungry and I was worried about getting an apartment, so I, I went down to the left and got the artist in finances. Because I was like, I need to write about, read about my finances. But I remembered that that book had glowed and it was like otherworldly and strange. And I, for some reason, it, I wasn't ready for this book or whatever yet. But fast forward, later on I had chanted uh, the Lotus Sutra, um, which is known as the highest teaching of the Buddha. And I had chanted it, and then here's where my veganism, the yoga, and everything led to an awareness where my heart opened up, and I realized that the point of my life, the point of my heart beating is this wish, this absolute wish that we have world peace, that, that this world will someday realize a majority of the people will be conquering their greed, anger, and stupidity, and overcoming the sufferings of birth, aging, sickness, and death. So that's what we try to do by educating one another and giving each other the tools to do that. So that's what I'm hoping to give you is the, is the most powerful tool that I've discovered to be able to readily change poison into medicine. Now what does that mean? Readily change poison into medicine. Like anything, like changing fertilizer into beautiful crops, changing a poisonous condition that you think you can't overcome, but you have an enlightened nature inside of you that can overcome any challenge that you're facing. And that's where you become a winner because then you develop more courage, you develop more life force, and you develop this faith in yourself and in your Buddha nature. So then it's an active practice. So, okay, so where was it? So my heart woke up and then I had a pretty bad cliff accident because I went as a yogi vegan. I couldn't stand people anymore and so I just wanted to get away from everybody and teach Tai Chi from the jungle and I figured there would be video services so I could just film it all and make, make a movie of my life and just send it back to contribute. But no, 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 life had different plans. So I had a cliff accident and compacted my spine and then I had the choice of Florida or LA, and that's when I began to be able to practice this Buddhism. 
Um, so in a sense, I put down my arrogance and anger about the world and was able to more participate in meetings, which now you can do in 198 countries. You can participate in living rooms, and it's not a television event. It's not something that's being publicized. But it is available and it's happening worldwide and it is a movement. And that movement is called Kosen Rufu. Kosen Rufu just means propagation of the tools and teachings of the Buddha that lead each individual to becoming sincerely, absolutely happy. So if people call the SGI a cult, I'm fine with it because that if people want to behave like a cult or in organizational religion they want to behave strangely, that's their problem because Buddhism focuses on the individual and the process of human revolution. So human revolution, what does that mean? Like how do you, what is a revolution without picking up a gun, right? Well, we know it leads to that. So I'll give you five key points on human revolution. Um, one of the negative aspects that will shut your spirit, spiritual path down is evading responsibility for one's life and blaming others. Okay, so a positive counteraction for that feeling that it's other people that are causing us to suffer. Uh, rather than that, chant nam myoho renge kyo so that you can be determined to stand alone. So that, okay, people are gonna behave that way. Well, let me have the life condition and the courage to be an example. And so let me chant to uncover my Buddhahood. Okay, well again, what is Buddhahood? I'll go back to that. What, what are we uncovering here? Well, well Tian Tai, the greatest Chinese teacher of Eastern philosophy, basically broke it down to these kind of 10 levels that we have here on the television. Mm -hmm. And then here at the bottom, it's considered hell. So hell is a life condition where you wake up in the morning, maybe after a jazz fest or something, and it's just been an incredible time, but then the rent's due, you get an eviction notice, and your cousin broke his leg, and you, the phone, oh man, you just feel hopeless. So that's a life condition of hell. But then you're like, man, I just want some granola and some sausage biscuits from McDonald's. So then you're hungry, you know? So there's hell, hunger, animality, which is also called the path of the beast. These are the three lower paths. Animals are all about control and be control in a sense. So people operate at about 90 something percent of people probably operate at that level. Control or be controlled. Where you want to control or be control of other people. So hell, hunger, animality, anger. Anger is a form of arrogance. Um, but anger can also be the force for positive change. If anger is used in an enlightened way, you can cause justice to happen or things can happen. So each of these nine worlds, and I'm going to go up to Buddhahood being the tenth world, is just an analogy of everything that's dualistic, positive and negative. Hell. The, the negative side of hell is, God, I'm so hopeless. Tidy whitey, debt-based currency, nuclear war, Bush and Trump. What the hell am I doing here? <laughs> then it's like, okay. But then... Um, Okay, so how do you, what's the positive side of hell? Positive side of hell is you're sick of being sick and tired. Like you're, you, you, you get angry that you're in hell. So you're like, okay, I gotta pull myself up. And then hell, hunger, animality, um, anger, humanity or tranquility. Let me watch the TV. And then it's like <coughs> learning, let me go study some new spiritual philosophy and be with others and expand my life. So you feel learning, then realization, ah, you know, then I can do things, I am empowered. And then it leads to bodhisattva. Well, what bodhisattva just means is helping, helping others achieve the way. So maybe after this weekend you heal yourself and then going to visit somebody in the hospital next Tuesday is not so bad because you, you can share, you can lift that person up that's less fortunate than you. And so, okay. So the history of me, the Lotus Sutra was growing, I passed, blowing, I passed it up, and then eventually a cliff accident. But the main thing is that through the yoga and veganism, I realized my heart was like, okay, world peace. But then it's back to hell, like what can I do? But I can make a difference, you know, thanks to, thanks to Melody and Kalem and my practice of chanting 
for 16 years now, you know, and it, it's, it's not like, oh, I've been chanting 16 years. It's like every day I have the chance to be reborn. Like I can connect and I can change my negativity. My, you know, I can change something into something beautiful thanks to other people and the life condition I've developed. So that's living proof of it. I mean, I've had a spinal accident. I've been bitten by a brown recluse uh, spider. I've overcome Lyme's disease. I've tried to renounce and leave civilization a couple of times. It doesn't work. I have to come back. Usually I'm even dented and even more, you know, banged up from it. But uh, so, okay, so back to the five tips that can keep you positive in your spiritual path of human revolution. Now, I recommend doing the Buddha's, the Buddha's teaching and chanting. Um, does anybody know when we started? We're probably like 20 minutes into it. I don't want to burn you guys out. I just want to be on time. Do it. It's 12.53 now. 12.53, so maybe we'll go another, maybe hopefully another, I can wrap it up in 20 maybe or less. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is the mandala of Nichiren Buddhism, and this contains the 40,000 teachings of Buddhism. Um, and again, the negative points, in my case, escapism, because I, I consider myself an escape artist, I'm very good at escaping. Escaping or avoiding challenges. Instead of that, I should have the spirit to challenge myself. Okay? Then doubt and disbelief comes up. That results in grumbling or complaining. Complaints. Well, I should have conviction and instead of complaining, encourage other people. Like get out of myself and go to a Buddhist meeting or go to a gathering and encourage other people so that I can change my doubt and my disbelief. Okay, that's another point of positivity in your path. If you feel jealousy or resentment, we all do, instead think, okay, let me create harmonious unity. How can I help instead of, how can I be grateful? How can I have gratitude instead of falling into the negative disparity? Disparaging myself and disparaging others is one of the things that reduces fortune and causes karma. Karma, what is karma basically? Action, or cause and effect. So we all know what we're doing with our karma. So if I experience fear or cowardice, then I have to summon courage, and I have to get on my knees, you know, and if I'm afraid of that audition, you know, and, and it's like I hate auditions. For 20, 30 years I've been an actor, but it's like when they, when they put you on the firing block, and you're like, you're in question, it feels miserable. But can I believe in myself? Can I get on my knees or in my meditation and, and say solemnly to the Gohanzen, which is a target of enlightenment, basically, it's developed in the same year that the mirror was developed. The silver mirror, I think, was something like 12, don't quote me, but something like 1272 or something. And they tried to take the technicians for the mirror and park them away. But as we know, we all enjoy a silver mirror. Well, before that time in reality, people couldn't really see themselves that clearly. It was like a polished copper, or you would um, look in a pool of reflected water. But the image was distorted. So interestingly enough, uh, Nitrin was a fisherman in Japan in the 1200s. And uh, he, Nitrin, Nitrin believed that the heart, the heart of Shakyamuni Buddha's lifetime teachings lay in the Lotus Sutra, and that the heart of the Lotus Sutra's practice lay in the never disparaging chapter. In one of his letters, he writes, "What does Bodhisattva never disparaging's profound respect for people?" Signify, signify the purpose <clears throat> the purpose of the appearance in this world of Shakyamuni Buddha, the Lord of, Lord of teachings, lies in his behavior as a human being. This letter, which resounds with praise for the humanism of the Buddhist doctrine, stresses that the truth of Buddhism is to be found not in the words of the sutra alone, but in the Buddha's aims as they are revealed in his actions as a human being. So, Bodhisattva never disparaging, bowed. He bowed to all kinds of persons, all kinds of people, 
in order to awaken them to the reality that all possess the Buddha nature within themselves. In doing so, he gave expression to boundless courage and a faith that could not be shaken. Nietzsche, in his comments on that chapter, says, it is like the situation when one faces a mirror and makes a bow of obeisance. The image in the mirror bows back to you. So that brings me to an interesting principle in Buddhism called Esho Funi, in which that's Japanese for the, the subject is one with the environment, and so that other people are a reflection of what makes us uncomfortable in areas that we'd like to grow, or maybe they make us happy in ways that we admire our own selves. And so Buddhism says that the, the, there's no separation between the subject and the person or the environment. So if in a sense this highest teaching, <clears throat> what is this Lotus Sutra? What is this medicine? Well, the wonderful law of the Lotus allows you to take the fertilizer, the compost of greed, anger, arrogance, and stupidity, in which we have a gumbo, like a Louisiana swamp. You take that mess, you take that, whether it's, you know, you want a new, you know, vegan Ginzu knife that costs $10,000 or whatever. Whatever it is, you put that into your determination, like, I want to start a camp to help people teach you know, organic sprouting. Whatever it is, whatever your goal is, use that determination in your prayer, and the Buddha recommends chanting the wonderful law of the lotus. Well, what does that mean? You could go your whole life studying what that means. Um, so I'll go to Nichiren, because he was the young fisherman in Japan in the 1700s that looked at the maze of Buddhism and said, well, wait, this is a, a philosophy about peace and dignity and humanism and respect for all life. Why is the Japanese government saying that we're Buddhist and engaged in all of these horrific things? So they, in turn, tried to kill him six times. You know, that's usually the, the remedy, right? Is censorship for a leader or somebody who sees. So anyway, they forsake him to different islands, tried to cut his head off. But he was known as the clarifier of Buddhism, and he argues that the Lotus Sutra is champion. So go back to the, the ten worlds, because we're coming in on the mysticism or the magic of how you're going to change whatever circumstance you have into more benefit, more strength, more courage, more wisdom, and compassion. Not just compassion like where you don't have the wisdom, because sometimes compassion is like putting your foot down and saying no. You know, sometimes compassion is not being nice. You know, sometimes being wise is having to protect yourself and protect your children, whatever, you know. So, okay, so interestingly enough, Nietzsche, who continued to write letters through his, um, can I have a narcissistic moment for a minute? This was, damn, you see, and I did that and I lost my place. Because I got my ego wanted to show off for a second. I was like, see, this was me when I was all vegan and long hair and like, you passed me over the world. That's a real vegan. That's a real vegan. Wow. Yeah. That was when uh, I started practicing Buddhism in Los Angeles. And uh, well, I had to just brag for a minute. 1064. But this is really important. Sorry about that. Okay. Come on, man. this is so good. Do it, you can do it. Person in the law, 1094. Okay. Okay, so, got some history. Um, some history, 1094. I'm sorry, guys, I'm having a dyslexic page head. First name. Wow. Okay. okay, got it. I'm back on target. Okay, so history, my history. So, thank you. So that was me, vegan, and like hours of yoga, and practicing the Lotus Sutra. So, uh, 
that really saved me from my arrogance and my anger and my awareness of being so painfully aware of everything as I as I just, you know, I mean, I love I love cannabis a lot at the time and psilocybin. I grew up um, harvesting my own mushrooms in Louisiana. And I really appreciate entheogenic experiences. I'm a writer, an acting coach. I've been a massage therapist for 20 years. I, I'm on TV shows, movies. I produce, I direct, I make videos. Um, so I believe that my life has become a lot more expanded by my practice with others and practicing with you guys and having this opportunity to, to talk expands my life and then I can overcome some of my deeper difficulties. And that's what it's about. It's about us overcoming and winning in our lives. And so you're helping me to win by sharing the law, basically, this law in the universe that exists. No matter if you feel evil or good, no matter, it doesn't matter. Like the, the value that your spirit can create supersedes your feeling if you're doing good or you're bad. You know, I'm I'm doing I'm not eating perfectly. It's about you becoming totally, absolutely happy. That means free in your diet, respecting your choices if you're going to eat a certain way and not putting yourself through torture. It's about catching yourself mentally and reflecting honestly on your life. So this came about the time of the mirror and Nitrin says about the person in the law. Like, do you follow a guru? Do you follow a person or do you follow the law? Well, that sounds great, but what is the law? And when do you know when people are exhibiting the law or they're not? Well, in truth, Buddhism says they're always exhibiting the law. And, and Buddhism also says that evil and good are informed by the same entity. That life is the entity of good and evil. And good and evil has existed since time without beginning. Mm -hmm. So if good and evil have existed since time without beginning, and time itself is one entity, time is one entity as past, present, and future, then it doesn't seem like it's going away that soon, right? I mean, it doesn't seem like, you know, the evil or the killing. So we have to become more strong as, as bodhisattvas of the earth or people who understand a greater truth and a, and, and a, and a wisdom of justice that's going to persevere through this kind of disaster that we have right now, socially speaking. I mean, we're, um, this is a touch of heaven this weekend to come out on a, whatever price, you know. If I had an extra thousand, I'd kick it in. Luckily, I'm here for free because I get to teach, so thank you, uh, Melody. So, Nitrin says here, if I could read as my eyes change focus and probably detoxing with all the vegan stuff, so my eyes go, woo, woo. But, um, he says, and again, he's been exiled. They try to kill him three times at this point. Eventually, the government becomes afraid of Nitrin, the Buddha of the latter day, um, because they just give him his own retreat, and they just like, they're just like, okay, this guy can't be killed. And anyway, but that hasn't happened yet. So he's in a mountainous place, set to freeze to death, you know, with ice sickles hanging off the roof. You know, just totally a place that they, the government sends people to die. Basically, in feudal Japan. But he's still writing encouraging letters to you and me here, still working in 2000, 2016. So, this is a mountainous place, he says, remote from all human habitation. Not a single village is found in any direction. Although I live in such a forsaken place, deep in this mortal flesh, I preserve the ultimate secret law inherited from Shakyamuni Buddha, the law of teachings at Eagle Peak. My heart is where all Buddhas enter Nirvana. My tongue, where they turn the wheel of the law. My throat, where they are born into this world. And my mouth, where they attain enlightenment. Because this mountain is where this wondrous votary, this person who supports the Lotus Sutra, dwells. How can it be any less sacred than the pure land of Eagle Peak. This is what the Lotus Sutra means when it says, since the law is wonderful, the person is worthy of respect. Since the person is worthy of respect, 
the land is sacred. The Supernatural Powers chapter reads, whether in a forest, beneath a tree, in monks' quarters, in such places have the Buddhas entered Nirvana. Thus, those who visit this place can instantly expiate the offenses. Can those who enter this place, those who enter in this meditation of, of changing poison into medicine, of saying, yeah, I've done this, I've been that, yes, but now I'm concerned with my enlightenment. Now, I'm taking these poison that I'm going to sing them into harmony. I'm going to use my vocal power, my words, to change my karma into mission, you know, of world peace or whatnot. Um, it's all relative to how much benefit you want to create in your life because you can start contributing, you know, in this movement and you're creating fortune for yourself. So your participation you can make calls, you can do art, you can, however you want to be involved, you make causes in the realm of the Lotus Sutra, and you will see tangible benefit in your life. Tangible benefit. It's called conspicuous benefit, and you'll also encounter inconspicuous benefit. Like, just like the other day, you know, I have a, a spare computer, like my seventh computer deep in my lab. And like one computer, I have some writings on it, and the power supply went off. But it's like interestingly enough, I moved into a house that has a new power supply for a computer right there on the shelf. It's like the kind of serendipity that we enjoy as vegans, or or the, when we reduce our karma, when we when we when we take choices or actions to reduce the negative harm that we. Sometimes we're able to receive instant karma or benefit or a signal that shows us that we're on the path. Well, if you want to short circuit that and create a lot more benefit for your life, you can sound out these words of the title of this Lotus Sutra. And I'm going to get to um, a, a definition again of what that is. But anyway, so he's basically saying um, that he's the happiest person in the world forsaken to a mountain village because he realizes enlightenment is such a great, greater treasure. Like he's truly happy because his suffering has been so deep. So if you feel like you've suffered very deeply, then celebrate that because you can use that. You can use every negativity simply by facing it. It's a little queasy. To tell you the truth, when I was a little kid, when the washing machine went out of balance in the house, it was like, I think I was like two years old or three years old, and you hear, boom, go, boom, go, boom, go, boom, go, boom, go, boom. You ever heard a washing machine go out of balance, right? Well, that scared the poo out of me when I was a kid, you know? I was like, whoa. Well, human revolution, changing your insides so that you can shine your light of Buddhahood it's kind of queasy. It's like a washing machine that goes out of balance because when you start to do your meditation, there's going to be like, oh, no, maybe I should just get to my smartphone. i got to go check my emails and all that. You might, I find myself trying to get out of uh, the feeling of human revolution, of like the habit of, no, I don't want to face my enlightened life condition. I want to run. I want to escape. I want to blame. And then they yeah. come back into the suffering list, so I might as well get enlightened and chant for my, um, you know, in, uh, for people that you don't agree yeah. with or whatever. And so um, that really, really, really works, and that's why I've continued to do it for 16 years. And um, okay, so a little bit about Nitrin. Um, okay. So, one statement about Namyo Horinge Kyo, uh, and again, this is an introduction. I hope, I don't know how much more time do I have, do you think? Do I have like maybe 10 more minutes? What feels right? About 10 more minutes ago? Or five? Um, up here I have cards, and again, Nam is a Sanskrit word. It means Namu, or fusion, or devotion to Myoho, which means mystic law. Um, or wonderful law of the lotus. So it means the wonderful law of the lotus, and it was clarified by 
The teachings of the original Buddha, 40,000 teachings, were congealed down into Chinese from Sanskrit to Chinese by a translator named Kumara Jiva. And those were translated into Chinese, and then through all those volumes, for since Nichiren was a 12 year old boy, Nichiren, um, he sorted through that since he was 12 years old and to, to try to understand the entire life of the Buddha. And then he wrote letters according to that structure of the Buddha's lifetime teachings. And what that arrives through, through the great, Tian, the great teacher of China named Tian Tai and Nichiren Daishonin, who's known as the Buddha of the latter day. Now, he didn't rob Buddhism and say, it's my Buddhism. He took the original India Buddha, Shakyamuni Siddhartha, and congealed it to a modern practice that we can all practice by sounding up. You don't have to say it that way. You can just say it. However you feel, if you're angry, you're tired, you, you want to raise from your boss, you want you know, new recycling bins on the, on the end of the block and you're going to develop the life condition to go challenge the neighborhood. Whatever you want to do, you can chant these words, which are the highest teaching of Buddhism, as nam myo ho renge kyo And these cards are available for you up here. Please feel free to take as many as you like. On a few of them are my name and my email address, if you'd like. And I can also leave a pen and paper here if you would like to write your email or your social media, um, if you'd like more information, I can send you an introduction on Buddhism free of charge. That, um, and again, this is not about money, but it is an organized religion that I support. I'm an artist, and my company is called Via Belly Arts. I'm a 3LC or L3C or something like that. And um, so I'm a hybrid corporation that my mission statement through artistic means, multimedia, video, production, massage, everything that I've done, world peace videos, is aimed towards the SGI or Sokogakai International. And that's the Japanese lay Buddhist organization that was known as the Nichiren Shoshu Temple. And the Nichiren Shoshu Temple the head priest disassociated 10 million Buddhist believers in 1991. It was the largest Buddhist excommunication in history. He sort of went dictator and said, this is my tool of the universe. All you can only get it through me, and it's going to cost you. And meanwhile, I'm going to destroy this $2 billion temple and cut down 2,000 cherry trees. So I'll see you all later. You know, have fun with that. You know, that's kind of like, that would be an example of extreme arrogant, aristocratic ego, you know, to take a tool like this and squirrel it away and say, hey, no, you can't have it. But in the SGI, we believe that each and every one should become happy, but this is not a religious um, event. In a sense, this is not an SGI activity. This is me as a Buddhist sharing my knowledge of Buddhism with you guys. And so, um, but I do use the reference materials that the Soka Gakkai, which means value creation society. Now all that means is that their collective goal of the Soka Gakkai is to realize each individual becoming happy. Now, I mean, you know, that's a beautiful thing. It gives me a relief to know that when I practice with these people, their main concern is that I become happy. Now whether that means I go in a corner and drink a bottle of Drano, that's my problem. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Just joking. But, uh, okay. So, no, but seriously, guys, it's like um, a really great movement. And what else did I want to share? Um, I also have a Buddhism dictionary here, which is very helpful if anyone wants to see that in your, in your practice of yoga, researching Hinduism, Buddhism, Eastern philosophy. Sometimes having a good reference for the terms that you encounter whether they be Hindu gods or, or whatnot. Um, okay, so basically, um, that whole history involves you being able to chant, and so now you have the key, and the website here is on the back. 
You can study about all of the basic Buddhist principles if you feel like you'd like monthly encouragement. You can get the monthly magazine. And there's also, um, oh, one more thing I wanted to say about this Gohanzan, this is called. This is Nietzsche in sort of a happiness manufacturing machine. It's a mandala. Um, it's not worshiping. There are, the, there are, there's Brahma, there's Chakra, there's Indra, there's all of the Buddhist deities or gods throughout Hinduism and Buddhism depicted in characters. There's also down the center, most predominantly, Namo Myoho Renge Kyo Nitere. Nietzsche means sun lotus. So you're opening the sun lotus of your heart through the principle of chanting and sounding out your Buddha nature. And so and when you do it with this target, this is a metaphor. So they're not actually gods. They're functions of nature. So it accords with physics in a sense that you can get as mystic as you like, but it also accords with common sense physics. So the principles that operate in light fractionalization, like the rainbow or the chakra system. We all, maybe some of us have had experiences with our own chakra system or with the connection between rainbows and our environment. Well, those are all features and laws in our environment similarly to gravity. And when we do yoga and veganism, I find myself that I'm more aligned with Brahma or more aligned with the higher spheres of heavenly action or um, greater sense of causality, whatever you like to gods or however you want to look at it. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that it's not a worship of gods or a Buddha. It's actually all about you activating your Buddha life condition and then achieving your human revolution so that you're able to overcome obstacles and be indomitable, which means like without defeat. And Believe me, in France, I've lived in France, Egypt, uh, Ukraine, Ukraine, all these places I've lived, and I've been back myself in many a corner. And uh, I've been very thankful to have this. It's probably my most valuable object because it, you can get it basically for free in a sense, but it's, uh, it's my ability. And also, I've, I've done um, trips where I didn't have Gohanzen, and it's still fun to just chant. But if you do have a Gohanzen, it activates your practice to the next level to where you're able to see even more clearly. And the Gohanzen becomes a reliable physical manifestation um, of chanting. So basic practice of chanting, if, if anyone wants to kind of chant with me, I'll kind of do the basics. The beads are meant to symbolize many things in Buddhism. You may already have a connection with beads or not. Basically, in my frame of reference, it's to support the sense of touch. And so then my brain, being a five sense organism, likes smells and touch. And so the candles occupy the incense, occupies my nose, the beads occupies my touch. And then um, the, uh, the sound of the bell, usually in Buddhism, is meant to sort of organize people. and. Uh, I'm getting so hyper and excited, I like misplaced it. Okay. So, okay, so yeah, the beads are meant for that. The incense is meant to sort of purify the sense of smell and uh, good lighting. Usually there's evergreens or some greenery that you want to put at your altar, and uh, that helps you remember the sustaining of nature. Sometimes people put water. Any kind of offerings at your altar is meant as a representation to help you connect with your meditation or to help you connect with your practice. And basically, if anyone would like to chant with me, um, that's how I'll end this class is uh, chanting the Lotus Sutra. And um, that's how I'll end together. By, I'll chant it very slowly. And I'll start with Nam Myo Ho Renge Kyo. And if you'd like to join, I'll repeat that. And then eventually I'll stop with three of those and then we can close out. So if anyone wants to try no So if you have a 
somebody who's really bothering you and you want to send them peace and love, you want to send somebody good fortune, think Nam Yo. Seems like that's what's helping people the most. And 
that's really what matters the most. So that's basically it. Um, and uh, I guess I could close <laughs> by, by throat singing Gongyo for y'all if you'd like. I, if you want a blessing of peace from my heart, I can um, I can chant Gongyo for you um, with throat singing. And I'll just wish you guys the best. Um, practice in whatever path you choose to take and this is the path I've chosen to take um, because I felt like I could make the most difference in real life and be a spiritual person and still sort of uh, survive <clears throat> so it's been a real great treasure I think I'd be dead ten times over had I not been chanting and meeting with people like yourself for 16 years because it's given me the chance to overcome so many of my problems. So thank you for listening and your attention. And uh, thank you again for giving me this chance to share and overcome my problems. And because uh, really sharing helps me build my fortune. And so uh, you help me overcome my illnesses. So thank you. And I'll, I'll go ahead and as a, as a gratitude for, for y'all paying attention and learning, I'm going to chant the two main chapters of the Lotus Sutra, and you can do whatever, you don't have to be um, sanctimonious or anything, you know, you don't have to be quiet, do whatever you want to do, I'll just uh, do that and, and send a blessing to you and your family. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no. 